if I could summarize the time we're living in, uh, go ahead, Aaron, and help me out. In chaos, you've got to find your promise. And that promise is filled with success and prosperity. And what really success is about is about uh, being aware of the Lord on our path. See, if you can't recognize him on your path in times like we're living in, you're in trouble. Uh, and, uh, and he has prepared moments for you. Now, that's what I want to share about today and get you to a place where you will be sure and recognize your prepared moments. Because everything around us is changing greatly. With that in mind, you have to remember you are a prototype for this hour because you're in such a process of change. Everybody say the word process. process. Now, that's what I want to talk about first is coming back from Poland. Uh, Poland isn't the easiest nation in the world to start with, and I've been several times, but uh, when COVID happened and in March 2020 when God shut us down, uh, I, I really believe the Lord just pulled us all aside and said, you're going to have to understand, I am pulling you aside. You're living in a Passover era. That means every P Passover is very key for you to recognize. I wrote a book called Passover Prophecies. If you don't have that book, we've got quite a few books out there, three for 25. Just get what you need. So uh, uh, a lot of those books will help you right now. But that book really helps us through the next two years, specifically. And uh, when he pulled me aside uh, after traveling 550,000 miles a year, I had to say, Lord, what are, what's my life going to be? I mean, and he told me, he said, I want you to start over in your backyard. And... Uh, when I would get home from a trip, I would go immediately to the garden, walk the garden, settle in the Israel prayer garden, what I had uh, experienced on the trip, spend some time with the Lord, then I would go home. But he wanted me to restart in my backyard. And then uh, what he had me do for three straight weeks was build a fire in uh, the fire pit. And I am not a big tonguer. I've been speaking in tongues since I was 18. But, you know, some people are just tonguers. They just rattle it off, you know. I mean, they just. <laughs> but I've, you know, I, I interpret and I think through things, and uh, the Lord told me, you're going to pray in tongues three hours every day. I sat there before that fire, and I prayed in tongues for three hours. And then the Lord began to speak to me over uh, what I would do. He told me, the first year you'll be able to go to ten cities. And uh, then I began to ask him at the beginning of this year, Lord, our, my whole call since I was 18 has been for the healing of the nations. And I've gone to so many nations all over the world. And I said, Lord, I, I can pray here for the nations. I can do whatever you want. But the Lord said two words for me. You will pioneer again. Now, what he had told me during that three weeks I prayed in tongues in 2020, he said, you have pioneered so much you are not strong enough to pioneer for a season. And you will have to wait until I confirm to you that you are to pioneer. Because, first of all, the world has changed. 
and it's not easy to travel like we all used to travel. Uh, it's very difficult. The warfare is intense. Every nation is in hanging in the balance, it seems. Ours seems to be teetering in the balance. Uh, and uh, he had to wait until he had built me new and fresh to send me again. And caused me to recognize him. So, this year, uh, I was supposed to be in Korea the very first week of the year. But the Lord uh, postponed that to July. And then he sent me to Amsterdam, England, and Northern Ireland. And it was, a, 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 it was like a brand new journey. And this is why I'm sharing this for you. You have a moment in your life where you have to see your journey totally differently. And then he sent me to Costa Rica. What he showed me was I was going to have to hear him at every place he sent me. I couldn't just go minister because I can minister and because I've been ministering for 50 years. I couldn't go just because there were needs, because the kingdom is, does not operate on needs. That's not what it's about. The kingdom of God is within us, and the kingdom is filled with power. And uh, then, you know, you have incredible friends like Peter and Tricia and when a crisis like this happens, you want to immediately go. And you know you can't go to, it's time for you to go. You can't. And uh, you have to wait and you have to watch. And this is very important for you as you move forward. You have to wait and you have to watch very carefully. Uh, and you have to know. And so the Lord decided I would go to Costa Rica for a meeting of Latin America, which I hadn't been to Latin America in a long time. And uh, when we got to, and Costa Rica is probably the best nation of all the nations in Latin, Latin America. I, when I say best, it's, it's, a, it's fairly godly and it's uh, not as intense as some of the nations. And so when we got to the airport, they announced in Dallas that uh, immigration was very difficult in Costa Rica. And they said, so be sure you have all your ducks in order and be sure your papers are in order or you'll just be turned around there and sent back. Well, that wasn't like the last time I went to Costa Rica. But it caught my ear. And when Aaron and I got off the plane in Costa Rica, it was a sea of people at immigration. Now, I'm talking about probably uh, it would, immigration was packed. It was two lines left in that whole entire building, and we were on the next to the last line. And uh, anyone who's traveled with me, Peter, Tricia, uh, uh, John, Cheryl, anybody that's gone with me knows that I'm quite capable of pressing through. Anywhere, come hell or high water. <laughs> but I told Aaron, I said, I'm not supposed to do anything. We're just supposed to stand here. We're talking about, I said, if the Lord wants us to stand, me to stand here for three and a half hours, if that's why he brought me to Costa Rica, that's what I'll do. Wow. I'm fine with it. Well, Aaron even looked shocked, you know. And I said, so let's just pray and agree that every step we take, he will order it. And we finished praying and said amen. And this immigration officer walked all the way. You could barely see the front of immigration. Back to the next to the last line where I was, picked the rope up and said, didn't say a word, just did this. I mean, you're trying to say, is this an angel? Is he for real? Is this really happening to me, you know? And uh, then he put the line back, and Aaron started yelling, I've got his passports. I've got his passports. I've got to come with him, you know. And so 
he jumped out and went with me. Now, Jody Wood, whom you know, was on the very last line behind her. I, I knew I couldn't reach back for her. I knew I couldn't say anything because this man has not said a word to me. He took us all the way up to the front of the diplomatic line. He has yet to say a word to me. Took my passport, laid him in front of the guy, and the guy said, we are so glad you have come to Costa Rica. I, I, and within, when, within three money, minutes, we were out instead of three and a half hours. The people I was with were over like TBN of all of Latin and South America, and they were in shock. They couldn't figure out how I got out. And it was hard to even say how I got out. And yet, I could hear the Lord say, don't limit my capacity. I've, I have plans you're not aware of. Now, that's a word from God for us. Well, Poland, we got up to leave, and, we ha- and Aaron said, we've got a real short connection, and, you know, Heathrow is not easy to start with if you've ever been through there. And we get on the plane, and they said, We've loaded early, but we have an announcement. We're going to be an hour and a half delayed here. And Aaron said, we only have an hour and 40 minutes to make our flight to Newark when we get to London. And I said, well, I don't know of anything we can do other than just ask the Lord to intervene. And, I mean, we were there an hour and 20 minutes. We get... And the uh, pilot said, we're going to try to make up some time. He made up some time, and we got there, and we had 20 minutes before our next flight left to Newark. Some way or another, Brian, who's been with me for 30 years, had made us, because, you know, I'm always thinking American because I've flown American for so many years, and we're on BA, so we, we've landed in the BA terminal, terminal, and we're right there. Let's thank God for Brian. See, God has people on your path already. That is one of the definitions of success. God has people positioned on your path, but you're going to have to see them. Poland was incredible. It it was the most incredible time I've ever been in Poland. We had 150 Catholic uh, priests and leaders that came of the 700. Now, that's a miracle. To hear me, and you know, I'm not your most traditional person on earth. And, and they actually sponsored, because God is doing something in Poland, for me to be there. It was a really interesting time. But we get to Newark, and Newark is turned upside down. If you're flying out of Newark right now, or flying into Newark right now, And we get to get our rent car, and they said, you're going to have to go to the preferred desk. We went to the preferred desk, and there's absolutely no one there. So we went over to the regular desk, and they said, well, it's a mystery. She should have been here at 2 o'clock, and we don't know where she's been in the last two hours. I said, well, we... We just take a car. They said, we have no cars. None whatsoever. None. Well, one of the attendants, not the people who operate at the gate, was walking around this lovely 
black man. I mean, older, I would have to say 80. And you can see his role was just to help direct traffic. And he came over twice to check on me because they said, there's nothing we can do. You can stand in front of the preferred desk and hope that one day she will show up. (laughs) So I, I, I did what the Lord told me to do through that guy. I went and stood there. I was the only one there, looking like a nut in front of a desk where nobody was there. Well, this little fella came over and said, I keep noticing you. I said, well, we don't have a car. He said, we have no cars. And then he said the most incredible thing. He said, that guy that just came up behind you, he came here two days ago trying to get a car. He was so ugly to me. I hope he never gets a car. I said, okay, okay, (laughs) that's what he said. And I said, well, we would love to have one if there is one. He said, well, there are no cars. What else would I do? I stood in front of the empty desk. I couldn't move. I didn't know what to do. Now, this has a reason for this. When you don't know what to do, you stand. You don't do anything else. You just stand. Well, nobody is doing anything except this little guy, Easter. And he comes back and he said, I really like your hair. (laughs) And I said, well, thank you. And he said, they don't like me over there at the other desk. And I said, well, you're all I've got. (laughs) And he said, I'll tell you something. Can you drive a truck? I said, if it's got four wheels, we can drive it. He said, you're going to come with me, and I'm going to take you over there, and they're not going to like me, so don't pay any attention to what they say. (laughs) And I'm going to put you in front of the line, and I'm going to tell them, you're taking the truck. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Did not say a word. Knew not to say a word. Well, this guy just took over. I loved it. And he said, give him the truck. I said, well, we were really not supposed to. Look at all these people. None of them have a car. And he said, give him the truck. Well, they gave us the truck. We get down into where all the cars are. There are no cars. There's a truck. (laughs) And he walks and he said, do people think you're Santa Claus? (laughs) I said, well, a lot of kids think that. He said, I like you because... You glow and you have great hair. (laughs) I said, I like you because you gave us a truck. (laughs) Ooh, and we blessed him abundantly. (laughs) Now, I'm saying that for a reason. If you don't recognize today on your path, what God is doing in the midst of the chaos and trials that we're being confronted with, you're going to end up way out of time. 
And then we get here, and Trisha has gotten us a room, and we went in, and the manager came out to help get in a room because you have, <laughs> there's two places in the world that gives the best baskets, here and Amarillo. And that's why we love to go to both, both of those places. <laughs> and she knew I had a basket you'd given. Now, th this is key. Remember when they came back and told Jacob that Joseph was alive? Two things got his attention. The prophetic words that they spoke that only Joseph knew. See, they, the Word of God says his heart was dead because of grief. Dead. And it came alive because of the prophetic word. And then it became alive because of the wagon full of stuff they sent him. That basket made this lady come out. And she started talking and went ahead and checked us in. And I said, where are you from? She said, Warsaw. Poland. I said, we just flew from Warsaw, Poland. And therefore, we just began to talk. She began to ask me questions. We began to talk. I am telling you, this morning, God has your path. Amen. Now, yours has changed greatly. And drastically, but God has your path. Now, let me explain success, and then I want to get you to a place, and I want to impart something to you. There's a prophetic anointing here. And you have to learn to thank God for everybody on your path that he has put there. Now, remember that. If you lose that thankfulness, you're going to get more messed up. And like I said, Brian, some way or another, God used him to get us here. Well, he's been doing it for 30 years all over the world. And some way or another, by the Spirit, he knows his role. Well, let's talk about Brian for a minute. The first time I met Brian was in 1994, Mike and Cindy and I were doing a conference called Healing America's Wounds. And the guy I was rooming with was an incredible guy. And I went to bed because I was leading prayer at 5 a.m. And he came to our room, and I was in bed. It was 11.30, 12. And he opened the door, and he brought this kid in, and he said, this guy works for Peter and Doris, and we need to minister to him. Well, now, Brian had hair down to here, long, curly, blonde hair. And I looked up at this kid, and I said, that guy has so many demons. We will be up all night if we minister to him. He slept with them this long. He can go ahead and sleep with them one more night. And then I'll minister to him tomorrow. Well, now, think about that. Just because God brings somebody on your path that is questionable doesn't mean that God didn't bring them on your path. Thirty years later, I couldn't do my life without him. See, let's thank God for the people he brings on our path. But I ministered to him and ministered to him and ministered to him. Now, what is success? Success really, because see, he told, the Lord told Joshua, now Moses is dead. And I've been waiting 476 years and I'm not going to wait any longer. Just because Moses is dead, we're still going in. And he said, and Joshua, you're going to lead us, and if you'll meditate day and night 
over what I have said, you will succeed. And he had a hard row ahead of him. And success means to be correctly aligned in a way that whatever is right, whatever is fitting, whatever is proper about you will prosper. It actually means being at the right place at the right time. It means on your road, I have help. Now say out loud, I'm going to succeed. I will help you reach your next destination. That's what success means. It means you will gain wealth, you will gain fame, you will gain rank. Whatever it takes to get you there. It means there is a manifestation of an expectation that you have been hoping for for a long time that will happen. It means there will be a favorable outcome. Now look at somebody and say, you will succeed. Now say this, you're in a hard place, but you're going to succeed. Now, that's so important to know that because we are living in an era of war. That means it's warfare, it's conflict. You can't kick against the pricks. You're going to have to take your assignments and you're going to have to know that you can succeed in every conflict. But it also means there are new births for you coming along the way. And see, this whole era we're living in is about breath. It's about voice. It's about Holy Spirit awakening in you. See, you can't just operate out of the constructs of your thought process or you're going to limit God to you. Look at somebody and say, well, we don't want to do that. But Holy Spirit, because this is an era of war and it's also an era of Holy Spirit, he's going to be more prevalent in you than he has ever been. Go ahead, Aaron. Now, with that, In the midst of this, you have to understand there are times and seasons in our lives that are key for our victory. If we recognize and understand them, you will be able to unlock what you need to unlock. And another thing about it is faith works in time and place. Faith isn't just something that's out there. It isn't something that happens. It's God in you working in time and place. That's what Acts 17 says. He predetermines your time and faith that you might grasp for him and know him. And Ecclesiastes says there's a time. There's a time to praise. Turn, turn, turn. There's a time. There's a time for death. So you have to recognize you're having to process by faith everything in your path in time, no matter what it is. Now, another thing about time you want to understand is God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Faith is going to work in time and boundaries. And see, time, you have past time, you have present time, and you have future time. And you're made in God's image, so you have a past, you have a present, and you have a future, just like God. And how we move in time becomes so key 
because you're going to have a moment in time like yesterday that if you recognize it, you're going to get to where you're going next. A word linked with time is plethora. It's called the fulfillment of time. He's adding up everything that's going on in your path, and eventually he will pour out what needs to be poured out. And then never let earthly time confine you. We have an eternal time clock built within us. We see into eternity. See, I don't live down here. I live in the heavenlies. I just walk down here, but I wrote that book at the end of the year. If you don't have it, I want to encourage you to get it, Abiding in His Presence, along with Alamo Booth, too. If you abide in your place... In eternity, you're going to keep seeing things correctly. And when you're down here, don't lose the vision. And Pam will tell me sometimes, well, you know, I'm aware of where you live, but the trash still has to be taken out. (laughs) So you just do that by faith. Yeah, she's real good, Easter. (laughs) Now, go ahead, Aaron. Now, with that, you want to know that today, in time, God has an order for recovery, restoration, prosperity, and breakthrough. And see, what happens with us in time, our past is always trying to draw us and pull us out of time. And some way or another, you've got to get everything, good and bad, that's gone on in your past and get it before you in the present. And then God can speak to you and he can say, okay, this is how we're going to deal with that that happened back there. And this is how you're going to advance because I have a plan for you to succeed. Now, also you have to remember you are a work in progress. Cheryl, put your hand on John. (laughs) You, God's still working with you. Now, let's look at Peter. Peter is complete. He, he totally got it now. But look at the person next to you and said, you ain't there yet. <laughs> and because you're a work in progress, you're going to have to think correctly and If you keep giving repeated attention to anything or anyone that isn't part of your next few steps, that's going to shape you tremendously in a way and influence you in a way that might cause your path to go in a certain direction. You keep thinking And if you think wrong, you're going to develop a stronghold that's going to block you from getting anywhere. So today, while it is today, this is what Hebrews says, how you speak is how you'll triumph. And this whole era is about how we speak. Does that mean it's easy? No, it's awful. And it's hard. But God is in you. You're going to have to let him rise up and say, gosh, I just want to choke that person over there. But God is, God is rising up and saying, you're going to go bless that one. The enemy... 
keeps rising up. Why did this have to happen to me? I asked Keith that one time when he and Cindy both gave me words, and I was in and out of the hospital. I was had bad diagnosis, and they both kept saying, this has to do with your dad. Cindy gave me the word first. Keith called, gave me the, gave me the word on Sunday morning. He said, I just finished Sunday school. I called to tell you what you're going through has to do with daddy. I said, well, he was your dad. Why aren't you going through it? And he said something to me that changed me. He said, because I didn't see his future. You knew what got taken from us. And it affected you in a way it never affected me. I never saw one thing good about him. But you did, and you know the loss, and that loss is embedded in your emotions. changed my life you know he's something else that's a mystery of all mysteries Keith my Keith my brother most of you are familiar with him because he can come out with the clarity of heaven in a moment now so here's what the real war is about on our path and Jesus said this to us. He said, I came that you would have abundant life. Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy. I came that, and here's my favorite version that from Hebrew. I came that you would have abundant life and enjoy life. Satan came to remove what you could enjoy. And on our path, death, hell, and the destroyer is there. Don't ever be naive enough to think death, hell, and the destroyer is not on your path. It's on every one of our paths. Now, some of us are more familiar with them than others. My whole path has been encountered with death, hell, and the destroyer. And yet, on your path is abundance, joy, and wholeness. That's what the Lord says. And so... You have to know when you meet death on your path, how are you going to deal with it? I think this is the shocking thing for many of us who so love and trust the Lord. How do we deal with death on our path? Because you're going to meet death. The Bible says it's our last enemy. The Bible says it has a sting. Can't be prevented. It's just how you going to deal with death on your path. Are you going to live daily fearing it? Are you going to live daily facing it knowing you have an ultimate triumph over it? See, Pam, who seems perfect to everybody in the world, was, wasn't adopted until she was 12. She, uh, her dad was an aerospace engineer. Her mother was a beauty queen. They both ended up as alcoholics. Her dad got them adopted and committed suicide the next day. She went from living in California to living in New Hampshire in one day. So, you know, her life changed so drastically. She didn't have 
any time to really process. She just had to move on into the new. But there came a time when I had left the corporate world and we were in ministry. We ministered with this incredible couple. We ministered with quite a few couples. But this couple, uh, the wife was extremely talented. So one night I was up praying and it was 2 in the morning. I, I had not been able to go to bed. I kept praying and praying and praying and praying, spending time with the Lord. And Betsy, the lady, uh, was playing for the Miss Texas pageant because she was that level of pianist. Uh, and uh, on the way home, she was hit by a drunk driver and killed. So at 2 o'clock, we got this call. Shocking call by, from her husband telling us what had happened. And I woke Pam up out of a deep sleep, and I said, Betsy just got killed. We had just been with him the night before. Well, we got up. We spent time. She went back to sleep, and the devil spoke to her and said, there's really no life after death. It was such, and you know, she never told me. We continued on in life, but after about six months, that lie had attached itself to the grief and trauma of the death of her dad that she had never dealt with down in her. And this thing started manifesting. And beyond her control, it would literally, this demon, try to kill her. And she got so weary, she just said, I, I'm just going to end it all. See, uh, she went back and agreed with the lineage of her bloodline. And we would go through traumatic times, and I had a demanding, demanding life, and she did too, and she was office manager of the church, and uh, I mean, big church we were now part of. And so we had done a big youth gathering. Uh, on Friday night. So Saturday, I was to do a wedding of a couple that I was working with in China, and they were back in. This was during the 80s. And <clears throat> this thing grabbed hold of her. I can't tell you what would happen when this thing grabbed hold of her and how we would have to war and what it would do. And all of a sudden, I looked at her it and I said the Lord has told me to go do a wedding and that thing spoke to me through her mouth and said I will have her dead by the time you get home I said the Lord has told me to go do a wedding And I got out on the sidewalk to go get in the car, and the devil himself was standing on that sidewalk and said, I will have her by the time you get home. And I looked him straight in the face, and I said, that is between you and God. Has nothing to do with me. All I have to do is obey him. And do what he tells me to do. I am going to do this wedding. Get off my path. I went, did the wedding. I came back. 
really, I, I went by faith. I walked by faith. I did it by faith. Walked in the house. She was still laying on the couch. And nothing had really changed. I had changed. I had changed. The next week, through a series of events that I write about in one of the books, she, we had friends over. They said, you know, I know you know things about demons, and why do you burn things? I said, well, I don't know. Sometimes you just burn things because you're supposed to burn them. Sometimes they're evil. Sometimes you're not even sure why you're burning them. You just know you have to. That week, I found a book. I was going through my college books looking for an advanced accounting book. And I found a book called The Secret Conversations of Hitler. And I thought, how in the world did I get this trash in here? And I said, well, I'm going to burn it. I don't know how I got it, but I'm going to get rid of it. I lit the fire. It was in August. Lit the fireplace. A friend, our neighbor came over and said, your fireplace is burning. I said, yeah, I'm just trying to clean it out for the <laughs> winter. I put that book in there, and that book wouldn't burn. The book began to scream. I said, what in the world have I done? <laughs> you know, that's usually where I start. What in the world have I done, you know? This book screamed to the top of its voice. A demon flew out of that fireplace, knocked the vase off the wall. We had a vase on a platform. It was crazy as I've ever seen. I called this lady in the Baptist church that I had heard about, and nobody liked her because she prayed in tongues, and she knew demons. And I said, I, you don't know me, but I do know some about demons. I do pray in tongues. And I'm in a mess over here. My house is swirling. She said, well, open the back door and command whatever that is out. And I did that. Well, I'm telling this story to our choir director, and Pam gets the strangest look on her face, and she said, that was my book. Poke Cheryl, John. <laughs> that was, I said, really? She said, it was the last thing I had of my dad. I said, why would Clint, that was her adopted dad, he was chief master sergeant in the Air Force, have the secret conversations of Hitler? She said, it was not from Clint. It was the only thing I had remaining from my dad. And I thought, oh, God, you know, that demon might be nothing compared to what i just about to go through. <laughs> <laughs> She never said anything. That night, she got down on her knees, and she started weeping uncontrollably. And the Lord came down, visited her, and went down through her. She said she could see the hand of Holy Spirit in her, unlocking the eggs in her uterus. Because the, from the grief of that suicide, everything was locked up in her. She got so delivered from a generational curse that it was amazing. Now, Sunday morning, that was Saturday night, Sunday morning, the pastor gets up to speak in front of 3,000 people in the Baptist church and stops and says, 
the Lord just told me I don't have the message that someone here has the message. Shh. And Pam, everybody that knows her knows she never goes up front. Went forward, shared this whole ordeal in the Baptist church. Now, two of the staff members got saved. 150 people got saved that Sunday. We went to 3 o'clock in the Baptist church. And on Monday morning, I'm getting called in to the office. <laughs> Because we have eight families that are going to leave the church for this reason. Women can't speak in the pulpit. <laughs> now, I don't know Baptist. I, I am no good at it. I don't know anything. And I think. All those people got saved. Two of the people you're paying for here got saved, and you're going to leave the church because she was a woman? They said women can't speak in the church. All I could think was her obedience, my obedience of burning that book, her obedience set people on their path. Your obedience is going to set people on a path. All you have to do is know what you're supposed to do. Not what everybody else is supposed to do. And when you go through a crisis like this, all you're doing is hanging on to the Lord because God is going to require you to go through the seven steps of grief. So you can't just shake it off and say, well, I'm just going to get back up and do everything I was doing. You can't do that, Tricia. Don't ever let somebody try to force you to do that. You have to keep going. But you also have to let God work in you. And the Lord says to you, I, I see a word over you just while I'm saying that. The Lord says to you, I have two incredible times of transition for you. The Lord said, you keep walking, and when you hit the transition time, you will not have any confusion. You will say, I know what he's saying to the right. I know what he's saying to the left. And you will hear a word from behind you telling you which way to go. And the Lord says, you're going to succeed by, and I, I, it's, this is special grace I'm hearing from him. The Lord said, you, because Peter, really, that ordeal started in the first of December. The Lord says, I'm giving you 18 months to make this transition. I'm giving you transitional moments, two specifically, that you will not have one question about. You will know when you do them, and you will begin to move forward. The Lord says, Keep walking, daughter, because the grace that I have is all around you for this season. <laughs> now, this fellow right here on the front, I and mean, all of a sudden the spirit of prophecy is here. You stand up. Yeah, the whole family. Are y'all all go together? That's a beautiful family. <laughs> the Lord said, I have called you and I've given you blocks. I saw you. You were sitting there with blocks and you were trying to put them together. And the Lord said, you're going to be able to build the way I say build in days ahead. The Lord said, I've given you blocks and you're going to have to wait for my timing until they fit in the right places. The Lord says, don't try to build them out of time. 
The Lord says, build as much as you can build, then get back and look at what remains, and let me give you vision of how the others will begin to operate. And the Lord says to you two, you are in this process with him. And the Lord said, this is a new faith process for you. And it will cause you to come into a place you've never been before because I am going to build a house full of glory that you've never experienced before. And out of that house full of glory, you will begin to draw many in for ministry, saith the Lord. Now, let me finish this. In the year that King Uzziah died, this is one of my very favorite chapters in the Word, I saw the Lord. Now, think about it. This is the prophet. He had prophesied Isaiah for five chapters. But in a moment, when this situation happened in his life, he saw the Lord. See, when death comes on your path, in the year that King Uzziah, of Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. When death comes on your path, you have a choice to keep looking at death or to see the Lord. And all of a sudden, he saw into a glory realm he'd never seen before. He got such vision that he was able to prophesy 60 more chapters. That's what death did in his life. See, that's how you have to look at a situation because you have a journey to keep going on to the land of your prosperity. Your vision is near on this journey. Go ahead, Aaron. And this year, it's about how will you go through and gain access. See, this is what I've been practicing all year. How will I gain access into Costa Rica? God did it. How will... I keep from having to call one of you to come pick me up at the airport in Newark. God did it. The favor of God on you will give you access. All you want to care about this year is that you keep that favor on you. Well, you shine and I like your hair. Let's thank God for my hair. I mean, I'm telling you. And that's what Aaron said when we were in Costa Rica. He said, look around. Do you see anybody else that has hair like this? He just saw your hair back here at the end of the... I said, thank God for my hair. That's something I want to say to you right now. Then we're going to start closing. You have something about you that God has given you that he hasn't given anybody else that will cause you to have access. It's called the law of use. You're going to have to look at what you have going for you. Some people might say, well, I don't feel like I have anything going for me. You're still here. That means he's left you here because you got something going for you. It's really that simple. Peter's legacy will continue to live on. Incredible legacy. And one of the nicest people I've ever met. Let's thank God for what he brought us. Oh. I 
I mean, just incredible. Incredible. I always felt like I would say things that he would just look so startled at because he was so awesome and nice. But, you know, some of us, we've dealt with death, and our, our ministry is skipping not from mountain to mountain, but from pile to pile, you know, throughout the world. And you learn things. But, Pam said it this way. She said, you know, Chuck, God just tolerates you. She said, because, I said, because I'd asked her once, I said, you seem so confident. You don't seem to have any fears. And, you know, she's a very confident, beautiful lady. Lady. And I said, what fears do you have? She said, my greatest fear is I would have to do what you do. I said, really? She said, yeah, God tolerates you because you do things that nobody else will do. You go places nobody else will go. And then one time, Paul K.J. was speaking. He had been, it was at one of our summer conferences. He was so tan. He had been working out. He looked so incredible. And I looked up at him and I said, maybe I should work out. And she said, we've been married 50 years. You've never worked out. (laughs) And I said, and maybe I could get tan. She said, you you don't tan. You get red, red, and purple. (laughs) She said, You have good hair. You have great hair. You have a good face, and you're smart. Just work with what you got. (laughs) That's a word for you. Easter, just work with what you got. You can blow the shofar. If somebody comes at you, just start blowing it. They're not going to know what to do with that. You don't have to shoot them. Just blow the shofar. (laughs) Now, let's end with this. Isaiah had vision for the future of all of us because of the death he experienced. Vision... It's so important. This is what I want to leave with you, and then I'm going to impart it to you. Go ahead, Aaron. See, a vision is a picture of what you have in your mind or heart of something that's going to happen. You have to adjust vision. The idea of vision is not past or present, it's future. It means, and the word future means expected end. And once you have vision, you have to watch, plan, pursue, and set goals around what you saw in days ahead. Well, see, the enemy has to some way remove your vision. Vision is linked with hope. And then faith is how you press forward until you see what you saw. Look at somebody and say, I want to see what I saw. That's what faith is. You eventually see what you saw. Because if you see it, it's not faith anymore. So I want you to think of all the things you've seen. But you haven't saw them yet. See, without a vision... 
without prophetic utterance, a people go backwards. Prophecy is going to give you wisdom for the moment, but it's also going to cause you to be able to interpret your future. Prophecy is someone telling you the mind and the heart of God. Prophecy is what produces vision. The enemy hates the thought of you knowing what God is saying to you. He hates the thought that you'll stand up here today and say, I just really have one thing to do. I just have to hear God. I have to just see him on my path. I have to watch him reveal to me what I am to accomplish. And the word of God says in back, and I love it in the Living Bible, the vision is drawing near to you. I want you to just extend your hands out like this. Straight out. The vision's drawing near to you. You're going to be able to grab hold of it because we're going to decree you're going to stay in the right place at the right time by faith. You'll walk right into what God has for you. You won't miss it. You'll only miss it if you quit looking for it. It's the only reason you'll miss it. Don't ever let the devil tell you that. I'm just afraid I'm going to miss it. You're not going to miss it if you're looking for it. He's more interested in you seeing it than you are. Now let's all stand up. There's two things I want us to do because you're at you're at a new place. Last week when Trisha spoke, that was a turning point. You had to muster up every ounce of faith. You had to pull it up from your toenail. And let it out. God saw it. I couldn't be here had you not. Now I'm telling you. I know God too well. I know it. I walk with him. He tolerates me. You pulled it all the way up from your toenails. And you spoke by faith. Vision is linked with provision. When you have vision and you move forward, provision gets unlocked. I want each one of you standing there. I want our worship team to come back up here. Each one of you standing there, I want you to say, all right, Lord, how am I going to give in to this moment to go forward? I knew that I had to be here because God told me what I had to give. Therefore, he had to find a truck for me to get me here. Think like that. He had to send that little fella that nobody liked but me. I'm telling you now, he was amazing. No teeth, old, old. Easter, you look like 30 compared to him. Now, I'm telling you, and God sat in there and said, they don't like me, but I'm gonna, if you drive a truck, I'm going to get you the truck. I didn't have the heart to tell him I can't hardly drive anything, but we're going to take the truck. Because I knew the Lord said, 
Vision produces provision. We're going to worship. You're going to start back with that song you ended with. And we're just going to worship him. And then, is that David? David? David's going to lead us in communion. See, do you know what causes you to see into the future? Remember when they were walking on the road to Emmaus? They were in such trauma from the death of the Lord. He was walking there right with them, and they couldn't see him. That's what trauma will do. But they took communion. And all of a sudden, their eyes were open to their future. So, vision produces provision. We're going to give, and then today we're going to take communion, and you're going to start seeing in a way you've never seen before.